Good evening. Welcome to the Pullman City Council meeting for this Tuesday, October the 20th. It's nice to have you here. Again, we're doing a virtual council meeting, and we're going to be doing this until hopefully we can start getting those COVID numbers down. So with that, uh, Dee, why don't you take roll, please? Mayor Johnson. Present. Councilmember Chapman. Councilmember McCall. Councilmember Parks. Councilmember Sorensen. Here. Councilmember Weller. Councilmember Wright. Here. Heard from two of our council members, Brandon Chapman and Ann Parks, who could not be here tonight. Do I hear a motion to excuse? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify it by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, with that, our announcements tonight. Uh, it's two weeks now before the general election. I know you're probably getting sick and tired of hearing all the election stories, but if you haven't registered yet, you still can do it online or by mail until Monday, October 26th. You can visit wa.gov, just vote wa.gov or Whitman County election website. And many of you have already voted and I've already put mine in the deposit uh, points around here in Pullman. You can either mail a ballot or you can also at the drop boxes. So we've got two drop boxes next to each other on Paradise. That's right across the street from Paradise Creek Brewery, just cat a corner from the old city hall. We also have one by in front of Dismore's on Grand and one by the Chinook Student Center in the WSU campus. Whitman County Auditor Sandy Jamison says that she has complete faith in the postal system. We've been doing mail-in ballots for quite some time, it works. And she recommends that if you do use the mail, Make sure you postmark it by Friday, October 30th to ensure it gets postmarked in time for the uh, election. The Water Summit will be virtual this year. This is Thursday at 6 p.m. this week. It's gonna be live on Facebook. The program is similar to what we've done in person. You get an update on the water supply, also the alternative water supply study, a water documentary, Brave Blue World. John Kimberling and Paul Kimmel are the co-hosts like they have been since they started the Water Summit. Kara Haley, our own Pullman engineer in the public works, will be the MC this year. Gary Jenkins, our police chief, put out an excellent news release on Hall in Halloween 2020. Thought I'd just share a couple of the main points on that this year. It says, we ask community members to rethink their holiday celebrations, discouraging participation in traditional door-to-door -door activities. Instead, we urge families to consider celebrating Halloween at home, pumpkin carving, virtual Costume parties, festive movie marathons can be done. Wear cloth face coverings. That's over your mask if you do decide to go out. Avoid confined spaces by avoiding indoor parties, choosing safer outdoor activities. Stick with members of your own home uh, household. Wash hands frequently. Have respect for those who opt out of Halloween activities due to health and safety concerns. Only visit the houses that have lights on, decorations on display, or otherwise have indicated their participation. Stay home if you've been sick or recently exposed to someone who has COVID-19. Residents who wish to hand out treats should use porch or outdoor lights to signal their participation. Offer individual treat bags rather than commercial bowls, uh, communal bowls, and limit contact by placing bags on a table or on a sidewalk someplace where they can uh, take one at a time. And remember, social gatherings in Washington State are limited to no more than 10 people. Give yourself plenty of time and space to celebrate safely in accordance with the current restrictions. Our next item on the agenda is confirmation of appointment. I am recommending to all of you that our finance and uh, administrator, Mike Urban, be appointed as an interim city administrator in uh, filling Adam uh, Lincoln's position. Uh, I think we've all had a lot of confidence in Mike. He's done a great job. He's filled in for Adam on a number of occasions. And so I'm asking for council confirmation tonight on that. Al? Uh, just a <clears throat> quick comment before we vote here. Okay. Um, I know that Mike is stepping up here with the uh, city administrator position, which will put a little bit of a strain on the uh, financial department. So I just want to make sure that we are able to give him support in both areas as much as possible and that we move forward as quickly as we can 
uh, with trying to replace the city administrator. Yeah, and we were planning to do the uh, calendar the way we're looking at it uh, right now being October, November, December, not the best place to recruit. We can start the first of the year and we hope to have the administrator in position by at least March. Um, and we will be giving plenty of support to Mike. I've talked to him ahead of time. I asked him ahead of time, uh, do you think you can handle both of this? He has a great finance staff right now that can help, but we will need to give, and that's the console too. We all need to, to help Mike the best way we possibly can and, and trying to help him and his workload as well. So, any other comments? If not, do I hear a motion? Move to approve Mike as interim administrator. Second. Move and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. And thank you, Mike, for stepping up. Next, we have some presentations tonight. First of all, the, the annual report from the library, Joanna Bailey. Yes, good evening. Hello, Council. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, as I queue up the presentation, let me just give a quick shout out. Hello, Anne. It's good to see you again. Uh, Anne was, was instrumental in, in the Northwest Women's Leadership Association that I was involved with in its um, first year. And our very own Kara Haley is involved this year. So thank you, Anne, for all the support that, and wisdom that you shared with us. Let me go ahead and get the annual report up. Okay, here we go. So let me invite you to think back a year ago uh, before there was COVID, uh, back to 2019. And that is the year that we're going to be talking about. Um, the library, we were getting ready to, to provide this to you in March and then we were hit with the pandemic. So thank you so much for the opportunity tonight. Can everybody see uh, the presentation? Okay, excellent. So some key notes to start with. Our 2019 operating budget was a million seven. That is 7.3% of the city's general fund, which is pretty typical. Um, we always want to acknowledge and thank with tremendous gratitude the Friends of Neal Public Library, whose goal and mission is to supplement um, the library services, not to supplant them. In 2019, the Friends, uh, and really through community support, donated to the library $56,000. We also want to note um, 2019 was a significant year for us in terms of improved employee retention. So this is remarkable. In This is the first time in 19 years that no turnover occurred among benefited positions. This remarkable increase in, in retention is really largely attributed to your help, to the conversion of three part-time positions to full-time. This change added missing value to each affected staff position and really provided an, a more effective distribution of workloads. So what we did, thanks to your support, was we really broke the cycle of continuous hiring and that allowed long-standing goals to be realized it allowed the library to really um, take a strategic and innovative approach to public service through some department initiatives. To um, further augment the benefit of, of having staff with us uh, and not being um, in a chronic cycle of training, we took significant steps to streamline the onboarding process across departments. That uh, increased our organizational capacity. So essentially, because we weren't spending um, so much time having to retrain staff into the same positions, we then had an opportunity to finally um, address some of these, these other issues that were plaguing us um, and really keeping us from doing the great public service work that we are hired to do. So in looking at our onboarding process for our circulation department, we consolidated positions into a single department. So we had circulation and shelving, two distinct departments with, uh, under the umbrella of a single supervisor. And we combined them into a single department. We revised the training and we ended up with a 37% improvement in greater efficiency. For our reference team, um, we actually, really took a look at the entire training program and, and in getting feedback from recent uh, trainees through the program, what we heard was 
really the, to take a focus on the practical approach over the theoretical. We can talk about customer engagement. We can talk about a lot of how to search the library catalog, but there's nothing like actually putting hands on it. So focusing on that practical approach to training over theoretical actually resulted in a 65% greater efficiency. And in our technical services department, this is the department that um, takes all of our uh, new books that come in and it puts labels on them, it puts jacket covers on them and it gets them out to the public so that they can borrow them. We actually streamline our training in that department by 72%. So having employees stay with us for longer, spending less time in training allows all of the activity tonight that I'm gonna share with you to have happened. With the biennial budget, this was, as you know, this is our first biennial budget. We really saw an opportunity here to, um, to, fo to, have, to focus on um, several initiatives. And we really queued off of council's goals, the community identity goal, where we're focusing on parent child friendly amenities downtown, and your goal of strategic long-term planning and specifically modernizing uh, with technology and supporting community partnerships. So we really took inspiration from your goal, those two goals of yours, and turned them into five different foci for 2019 and 2020. So we will, we will go through that now. We focused on increasing resident card holders. Um, we had a variety of projects to do this. Uh, we, we had free scavenger book hunts around town. We were present for card registrations at schools. Uh, we attended community events. We pushed advocacy through radio ads. We went out into the community to do presentations. Uh, we expanded our uh, homebound delivery to pilot a program where we actually worked with any family or really any adult member who was homebound. Um, those, uh, those initiatives, those efforts of staff translated into a 16.5% increase in the number of residents who got a library card. Of those residents, 80% uh, of the total card holders of the library are residents and 40% of total residents are card holders. We really focused on inspiring and engaging youth but not just all youth, we, we do an excellent job. We have a very um, um, longstanding reputation for, for offering our very youngest patrons literacy and learning needs. But we could, we could have done a better job and we recognize we could have done a better job focusing on youth that are a little bit older, specifically ages 11 to 17. So that was the group that we spent 2019 and 20 focusing on. So for these older youth, as you can see here in the slides on the, on the presentation, we animate is big, big among youth. So we brought in Carlos Nieto and, and we had an anime workshop. And actually we, we started with one and it was quickly to capacity. So Carlos was good enough to come back and we held a second workshop also full to capacity, both uh, girls and boys in that class. Um, really cultivating and paying attention to girls who code right so there's this there's a program girls who code and uh we partnered up and through that through this program uh, we were off able to teach in a one-on-one -on -one instructional uh format we were able to to teach and mentor girls to learn to code and then we had a number of after school collaborations um, there is nothing like pizza and board games to bring kids together. And that is what was happening after schools. We wanted kids to have a safe place to go. They came in, they threw their backpacks down on the ground, they reached for the pizza, and then the magic started to happen. They formed into groups, we, and then they started playing board games. Groups were passing among groups, um, and the chatter was just, it, it was something that just brought smiles to our faces. Okay, so we continue to focus on continuous, continuous process improvement. And our focus in 2019 was improving the user experience. Um, we had, we heard from the community loud and clear that our public computers, uh, the way it was, it, it was set up in one long string was not working. Um, it was not a good format for folks who needed quiet workplace, work, work, uh, workstation time. 
And it wasn't a good space either for people who wanted to game. Um, and when you're gaming, you get really animated and you can't help yourself and you start talking to your, the person that you're, that you're collaborating with. And so it wasn't a good, it wasn't set up well. So we actually went out to both, both user groups and we said, hey, what would make this better? And they said, you know, it's really great to have this. We don't mind that we're sitting next to adults and the adults don't mind that they're sitting next to kids, but could you just split us up a little bit more? And we said, yeah, that's a great idea. So again, looking to the users, to our, to our patrons to help us inform change. What we did was we literally broke them into two pods and the pods are based not on age, but they're based on what the activity is. So if you have adults who are want to, wanting to do um, collaborative learning, they're gonna wanna be in the more um, active pod. If you have children who are needing some quiet focused study time, they're gonna wanna be in the quiet pod. So we, we piloted that and then we checked back in with folks to see, you know, is this doing what, what we all hope it is? and it's been a resounding success. Everybody's really happy, which is, which is great. We improved the wayfinding. Um, you remember a couple of years ago, we took down all the signs as part of a user experience project, and then we put back up signs that mattered. And one of the signs that matters is where's the restroom? And so we actually put that back up, but we did it again <laughs> based on uh, talking to patrons. Where would you want a restroom sign if there was going to be one? And people tend to look up and up and over when they're looking for restroom signs. They don't look eye level and down. So we moved our restroom sign uh, to one of the windows that is very close in proximity to where the restrooms are. It's up at the eye level that where people actually say that they look. And ever since we put that sign up, people are not asking us where the restrooms are. So again, we know that it's working. Uh, the other aspect is we, uh, we streamlined our communication, our engagement with the community. We had several bulletin boards that were scattered across the library and talking with folks about, hey, what would you like to see? What's the most effective way for you to hear about what's going on in the community, hear about what's going on in the library? Um, they wanted one place that they could come to that where they could post as a community member, they could post a flyer if they're looking for a babysitter, if they've got a community event going on. Um, if they want to inform people about something, they want a place where they can post and they also want to know what's happening at the library. So we actually put a new bulletin board up in front of the restrooms because people tend to gather around that area. And we really, we, we turned it up to, or turned it over to the community. Um, and it's been great. People really like it there. They like that they can post um, their own flyers and, and it's been very effective. So we expanded uh, service through technology. Um, the 200% improvement is really because we added, that, that's in our technology offerings. So we added scanning. And the picture that you see here in the middle, this is um, a woman who actually, she heard that we had a scanning station at the library and she, was trans, she had taken all of her, uh, the war letters from her parents and she had typed them up onto a computer uh, and then she needed, she needed to print them out. So she came to the library with three thumb drives and used our, our scanning station to scan over a thousand pages that she then put on separate thumb drives and mailed to each of her children. So they could, they could see what their grandparents, uh, great grandparents ex war, war experience was. So we added a scanning station. We added mobile printing. Um, again, queuing off of what it is that patrons find uh, really relevant and what do they wish they had at the library. Uh, one, of the, one of the comments we heard was, gosh, it would be really great if, as I'm sitting using my own laptop in the library, it would be great if I could just send a print job to your print station. But I can't do that unless I'm using one of your, the library's own computers. We fixed that. So mobile printing, you can be in the library on your laptop and you can send a job to the library print station and release it. And then we did one better. And we said, you know, this is good, but let's make it better. If you're at home, if you're sitting at your car in the grocery store or in the grocery store parking lot, you can send a print job to the library wherever you are 
and you can come to the library and print it out. So it truly is a mobile printing. We also offered self-paced skill building through a, soft, uh, a platform called Linda. Um, that is a very robust self-paced learning um, um, curriculum. And it really is one of the few um, curriculums that I've seen that's that vast. You could take classes in photography, classes in coding, class in, classes in fashion design, um, classes in, in uh, business management. It really is very diverse. So adding scanning, mobile printing, and, so, and uh, the lynda.com increased our technology offerings to the community by 200%. Our virtual reality, this was a, um, a grant that we got through the Washington State Library, and we were able to borrow virtual re Oculus, virtual reality equipment, and our focus group was our 11 to 17 year olds. You can see here in this picture, this was actually during the Pullman Art Fest. The library had a booth and we let people come up and try out virtual reality and they they loved it. Um, the 11 to 17 year olds loved it, but actually we were, we were a little bit surprised because the group that loved it the most and came back repeatedly were our adult seniors. <laughs> so uh, it was a hit with, with all ages really. Our facility improvements. So uh, first and most important, we have a new roof. <laughs> so we are not leaking in the library. Um, this is huge. And I, I really, I appreciate um, the financial support to, to, to put a, a better roof on uh, and Public Works help to do that. We also framed in a staff office. So this was, um, form before this project happened, our circulation supervisor was, was training. She was having sensitive um, conversations with patrons and it was essentially out in the open because there were no walls around her. So we really needed to do better. She needed an office where um, she could have some patron confidentiality and some, um, really when she was trained it really could be just her and and the employee we added more seating to the library um, when when we looked into the addition when we looked around the library all of the seats were taken so we needed more um, and so we were able to through the friends of the library add additional seating um, in the heritage edition and then along with that we needed more study tables the tables um, that the few tables we had got immediately pushed to the sides of the rooms where the outlets are, which is very understandable. Um, but that also meant that there weren't enough for people to use elsewhere in the library. So adding some good study tables uh, was, was really important. Okay, so volunteers, oh my goodness. Um, we would not be at the library that we are without our volunteers. They are the heartbeat of our library service. Our library board of trustees, and, and you see Anne there. I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight. Um, Anne has been a wonderful liaison uh, to the board of trustees. Um, the board is a, is a five member um, volunteer board. Last year, they donated 105 hours of their time. Um, they had a couple of subcommittees to help uh, work through some policy discussions. Um, so that's our, that's our board of trustees. Um, really in many ways my my right my right hand uh, as far as a group that i can go to we can work through some issues um, they're very knowledgeable about library services so that's been a very important support uh, network for me the friends of the library oh my goodness gracious 56 volunteers 530 hours this is a tireless group um, they are passionate about library service um, and really just a wonderful wonderful group to work with our English, English language learners, um, this is volunteer run. We actually used to have, many, many years ago, we used to have a paid ESL instructor. And um, we now have a, a volunteer instructor and she works with English language learners. Um, many of them are spouses of WSU and Schweitzer um, employees, students. And they find their way to the library and they find camaraderie and they find connection through these classes. 
Then we have uh, our own group of volunteers and our library volunteers, we have 22 in number. They donated almost a thousand hours in 2019. We have folks who help us mend pages and books. Um, we have folks who help us with our, our, sewing, our knitting and sewing programs. Um, they help us with our Grand Avenue Book Club. Um, they help us deliver books to senior citizens. And then of course our teen volunteers, they help us with summer reading. So we literally would not be able to do all that we do without our volunteers. At this point, I'm happy to take any comments you might have or any questions that I can answer. Any comments or questions? I, I have one question on the printing. Uh, obviously printers burn out and wear out. Toners cost money. Uh, printing cartridges, is that something that they pay per sheet or how does that work? They pay per sheet, yes, that's okay. right. It's 25 cents per page. Okay. That makes me feel a little bit more comfortable, <laughs> <laughs> especially with uh, being so easily accessible. That's, that's wonderful. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Eileen, and then we'll go to Pat. Yeah, Joanna, I'm, I'm sure this is just an oversight, but I've been um, working with the Senior Center and a senior association, I should say, and we've been looking to kind of expand our activities. And I ran across the book club in a bag and I found the catalog for the book club in a bag, but there was no actual information about what the book club in a bag is. I'm sure that's sure. just an oversight on the website because there's just, there's, there isn't anything about describing the program. Sure. And, uh, add that, stick that in there somewhere. So People can go to that and know what the book club in a bag is and how it works. Great, thank you, Eileen. Yes, for, for the group, the book club in a bag is actually a collection. Um, and it is it is a, t a single title, 10 copies, and it literally is 10 copies in a bag that anybody can borrow. Um, the, the idea here is you don't have to belong to a formal, a formal book club to have a book club experience. So we have, groups that, of friends that get together and they will borrow a book club in a bag. They'll sit around, they'll read the book, they'll talk about the book and then they return the bag when they're done. So thanks Eileen, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Okay, Pat Wright. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Joanna, I just have a couple of comments and both of them um, I would like to say are truly a tribute to you. Um, one is that I attribute the low retention rate and your efficiency in that regard as really part of your leadership style. And I really appreciate the work that you have put into that. It really, really makes a difference. Thank you. And so along with that is also then the external piece. I don't think a week goes by that we as council members don't get a comment from someone in the community about the benefits of the library and how much um, you know they appreciate the library being full service to them and that some of that service has been curtailed but it is again a tribute to what a foundation piece the library is to the community and thank you for showing that up for us joanna you're doing a great job thank you so much pat we have a great a really a truly great team thank you so much Any other comments on the library? If not, we'll move on to our next presentation. You, the consuls received a while back a very well detailed study on courts and municipal courts. And tonight we have Ann Flew who will be with us, but uh, Mike Urban's gonna do the introduction. Sure, thank you, Mayor, and good evening again, Council. So as the mayor alluded to tonight with us is Ann Flug as well as Megan Parks to present our criminal justice service analysis. If you remember this started last September and it was completed just before uh, COVID started and when we were trying to get it back on the agenda, we went virtual and it's been sitting out there for a little bit, but it's time that we bring this discussion back in front of council uh, to put a bow on the end of this and as well as consider some things going into the 21 and 22 budget. So just real quick as an introduction to Anne, she's our consultant, uh, a retired city manager. 
She's taught at Central Washington University and currently instructs at the Evans School of Business MPA program at the University of Washington. She's performed approximately 30 of these types of analysis in different cities and counties across the state. And Megan comes to us because she's currently a grad student here at WSU working in criminal justice. So she's been working with uh, law enforcement and has her piece of this as well. So as they go through, I'll let them pass to each other. And with that, Anne and Megan, it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening to the council and mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to um, do the highlights of this study, which covered a pretty broad scope. Um, for the council. And then at the end, if you have any questions or comments, we'll be glad to um, work with you on that. So um, Mike gave me great introduction, thanks. Um, we started the study in September last year um, and finished it in February. And so tonight is our, our COVID um, necessitated presentation time with you. Um, Megan helped me with a lot of the data and she is a PhD fellow from WSU. She's gonna talk about some of the data tonight. Let's see if I can make the, the um, there we go, the slides change. So the scope that we had was to um, look you have Pullman has with Whitman County um, that covers the court, the jail, probation, public defense, and prosecutor services. Um, and you also have a space lease with the county for the space that is used in City Hall by the court. So we are uh, we were tasked with looking at and and comparing um, three alternative methods of providing services. Um, one was the county contract and um, different scenarios related to that. One was, the second one was a standalone municipal court that could be formed by the city and would only serve um, city police um, tickets and uh, city attorney code violations. And then the third was to look at contracting with some of the other small cities um, as a group to do a, to do a municipal court model. Um, the theory being that that would help reduce costs. And um, when the draft of this study was done, it was fairly clear that that was, wouldn't be the case. And so the city asked me to look at uh, more in more detail at prosecutor and public defense services and contracting separately for those independently for those um, from the county. So you'll hear more about that a little bit later. So the key questions were uh, revolved around um, comparing the three options on these um, seven criteria. The first one has to do with the cost and we'll talk about that in quite a bit of detail. And then um, looking at the alignment of justice outcomes that the city desires and the city's um, interest in local control, um, the judicial philosophy and consistency compared between a district court and a municipal court. And then, um, looking at in various ways at interventions and or associated services and the impacts that those might have on costs and city operations. So there were three phases to the study. I'm not gonna spend a lot of, of time on this slide. Um, it was pretty traditional method. We did um, about 16 plus interviews. Some of them were individuals and some were groups. Um, there were two council members who were interviewed and the mayor. And then uh, we gathered data from various sources, 
um, both historically and current. The base year for the study was 2018 because there was, we didn't have access yet to full year data for 2019 at the time of the study. Um, we did analysis, we developed a, um, a caseload forecast and we also drafted um, the report and that was reviewed by the city. Um, we had quite a few comments on that and then that resulted in the final report and the presentation this evening. So I'm gonna do a couple slides on kind of the bottom line and then I'll go into a little bit more detail about the service delivery in Pullman and um, some of the characteristics of the system you have and the conclusions we drew um, from the study based on the study criteria about the three options that we looked into. So um, from a bottom line perspective for the city council and the mayor, the decision to select which court provider you want involves balancing a number of factors. Um, there are pros and cons um, to each of the criteria I, li I listed here in the uh, municipal court format and in the district court format. So kind of weighing each of those, maybe one of the options might cost more, but it might give you more local control and depending on how much you value local control, for example, you may be willing to pay a little bit more. So um, the second kind of overarching um, bottom line is that court practices can impact um, a number of associated criminal justice service costs for the city. So I listed here the different services the city is paying for now in the criminal justice arena. And um, we'll, I'll give other examples of how they interact with each other and affect costs. But as an example, the sentencing practice of the judge may differ um, widely from judge to judge. And depending on the sentencing practice of the judge, jail costs are affected, either up or down. Okay, so moving on to um, more of kind of the bottom line here. Um, this is the recommendation. Um, these are the, the key points of the recommendation. And then I have another slide that covers some secondary recommendations. So. For this city, this is um, what I'm describing as a roadmap to decision making. So over the next six months, you might want to discuss the court service scenarios that are presented here and, um, in, and the addition of expansion of the Parking Violations Bureau, which I'll talk more about later, and decide which of those scenarios are the most interest to you or which you don't have any further interest in and any follow-up questions you have. Um, the second action item is for the mayor and the council to adopt a Pullman criminal justice approach. And I will describe that for you in a, a future slide, but it, it enables the, the city to make a statement about what you would like to see the criminal justice policy look like as a guide um, for decision making in this arena and also for those who operate the departments that are affected. The third recommendation is to talk through what facilities you think are the most appropriate for the court and the violations bureau and probation services. If the, um, if the city decides to go with a municipal court, there are some um, options that you have at, at your disposal right now. And if you want to stay with the district court, um, there are some actions you can take, um, per, particularly with um, revising the lease you have with the county um, currently and or making some trade-offs, which might reduce your overall cost with the county 
um, for use of space that you have in excess now that your new city hall is operational. The last recommendation has to do with the criminal justice contract. Um, if you decide you want to um, go for, forward with continuing services with Whitman, Whitman County, um, you might want to dis describe or have a discussion about um, which features you might of the current contract you might want to independently provide versus the county and what parameters, negotiating parameters you want to give to the um, mayor and the, and the city administrator. Um, let's see. So the secondary recommendations have to do with um, menus that we provided as part of the study. So we provided in the, in the study some, some strategies that the city could use to either increase the effectiveness of your current system or decrease costs or both, um, particularly for your high volume cases and offense types, which we'll describe in a little bit. Um, in the medium term. Um, so it's a number of these strategies involve um, potentially uh, working with others, including the county and WSU, um, to address some of the higher volume misdemeanors um, and increase the number of interventions or treatment options that are available in the community. And the second input, uh, uh, recommendation here has to do with increasing the um, service level um, available to users of the court. Um, the city has a very high volume of parking and traffic infractions um, that as well as misdemeanors. And I'll describe what those are in a little bit. Um, but the majority of service is only available to defendants during the day. Um, there, many courts now have 24 seven customer service available either through the web or um, through police. And so there are some recommendations related to expanding cus customer service and, and convenience. And this second, um, secondary implementation or se secondary recommendation has to do with um, operating practices. So there's some security issues with the existing court, which um, would be good to address. Um, there could be some cross training between the Pullman staff and the district court staff that would help with coverage and backup and also customer service. And then the City of Pullman has for many decades had its um, data related to the court um, collapsed into the Whitman County data, not reported separately. So we're recommending that you ask the state to, like most cities, report the city's um, court data separately. And in fact, the, um, the city did ask the state and because it's been so long since the recommendations, they already implemented that in January. So the city is now um, has its court data reported separately. So a little background. Um, the state requires the city to provide court services and the court services the city needs to provide relates to um, city police and city attorney charges um, filed as infractions or misdemeanors. So what are infractions? Infractions are things like speeding tickets, parking tickets, um, some other violation of a city code um, like noise that are punishable by a fine. Misdemeanors are less serious crimes that are punishable by up to a year in jail. It's like shoplifting, minor in possession of illegal substances, driving without a license, et cetera. So the state law provides a number of options for the city to provide those services. Um, you can provide it with 
with the county district court system or pooled or individually with a municipal court. So in um, Whitman County, currently the city has a traffic violations bureau that handles infractions, parking and traffic infractions. And if there's a contested infraction, then the district court takes over. So if a, a person just wants to make a payment, they can do so through the city. Uh, the city does not currently have a municipal court, but you could. And the district court is run by the county. Um, the current arrangement, um, the, the cases that are heard in the district court include city cases, county sheriff's cases, Washington State Patrol, and other state agency cases, and Washington State University police cases. In, addis in addition, district court handles some select civil matters, which they continue to do if a city forms their municipal court. So there are three additional levels of court um, in the state of Washington. Superior court is um, paid for by the county and the state jointly, and that they process felonies um, from any jurisdiction in the county. So I thought you might be interested in who has what kind of court in um, Whitman, Minnesota and Latah counties. Um, so this is just a quick listing of which jurisdictions have what format. There are five municipal courts. Minnesota is the newest one in Minnesota County. There are um, a number of cities, the majority of cities that contract for district court services. And then Laetaw County um, under Idaho state law has a different arrangement where the city's cases um, are not subject to any kind of contracting. They're automatically um, processed by the district and magistrate courts in Laetaw County. So I'm often asked, what about WSU? WSU is considered a state agency so their misdemeanor uh, cases are filed with the county and the county covers the expenses related to those cases. So just generally, um, who pays for what? In the state of Washington, uh, in the overall system, uh, the cities tend to pay for the majority of law enforcement costs in the state. Uh, counties tend to pay uh, for the majority of court costs in the state of Washington, and the state pays for felony corrections. So uh, in other words, the prison system, the state prison system. And you can see here the, the fact that at each level, there's a little slice of other parts of the system that each pay for as well. Okay, statewide, um, there are a number of trends and I'm just gonna highlight some of them, not all of them here. Um, there is a significant shift in um, the state and actually many parts of the country um, from um, a sort of a, an approach to criminal justice that emphasizes punishment like jail to uh, an approach to criminal justice that emphasizes accountability and restoring the um, offender to uh, a functional uh, participant in the community. Um, this trend is, um, is has um, a caught on as a, with a desire to help defendants stabilize in the community and not repeat offenses and use the criminal justice system again and again during their lifetime, and also to reduce overall costs of the system. Nationally, this is also being fueled by the current um, interest in criminal justice reform and reducing overall incarceration rates. Uh, another trend is that 
the introduction of evidence-based programming and alternatives to detention into the criminal justice system for adults. In Washington, we've been very successful with juveniles and we're now um, using some of the lessons learned in the juvenile system with adults. Um, and that has been a trend that has been growing, particularly the last seven years or so. Regionalization is also a trend statewide um, for a number of reasons. Um, and then the increasing use of technology to um, improve service and reduce operating costs has been um, a slow trend to catch on in the courts and has been accelerating particularly in the last five years. Okay, now let's talk about Pullman's criminal justice system. Now that you've seen a little bit about the state and what the county does and what the options are, um, I'd like to talk a bit about the existing services and facilities for Pullman. Um, the court sessions right now are held in City Hall in your former council chambers on Tuesdays and Thursdays, pretty much the full day. Um, Everyone who has a Pullman address, regardless of um, who wrote this ticket or citation, comes to court at the former Pullman City Hall. So um, cases that were referred to the court by the city, WSU, and the state patrol and county cases all appear in Pullman at City Hall right now um, if they have a Pullman address. Um, probation services are also offered it, at City Hall um, on Thursdays. And there are two probation officers that meet with um, offenders. We'll talk more about that later. Anyone who is in jail, including those who might have been arrested by Pullman, the Pullman police, um, have their courts services provided in Colfax. So anyone who's in jail and anyone who does not have a Pullman address um, uses the, the Colfax um, court facility. I talked earlier about technology, um, the over-the-counter and phone-based services are primarily provided at Pullman City Hall by district court staff um, Monday through Friday during business hours. But there's very limited um, services after business hours, either on the web or by phone. Um, that what the city does, that's what the county does. What the city does is the city issues the tickets and citations and they collect fines, if there's any question about the um, infractions, they go there. That's handled by the court, the district court. And most of that activity takes place in the police department. Okay, here's a picture of what the courtroom looks like when it's set up for court. And this is a picture from a court day. Um, one of the things I did was visit all the sites and, um, and listen to court as it was convened and um, listen to Judge Hart, who is the judge in the district, county district court and interviewed him sometime thereafter. So the this is the city hall courtroom and a description of the literal services in the contract, which I'm not gonna read to you. And this is a picture of a smaller courtroom in Colfax and the front Colfax, um, that provides court services to those in jail and um, those who do not have a Pullman address. So we ask everyone that we interviewed where um, they thought Pullman was on the spectrum of criminal justice approaches. And on the left-hand side is using jail as a deterrent, kind of the punishment-based approach. 
And on the right hand side is community um, accountability and use of behavior, behavior change, um, diversions or evidence-based programs to uh, deal with particularly low risk defendants and reduce the number of times they interact with the criminal justice system. The center area is when um, the criminal justice system is beginning to, or is kind of halfway through transitioning from the traditional to the restorative justice approach. Um, most of the stakeholders found, uh, responded that they thought Pullman was a little to the left of the middle, um, a little bit more traditional um, and not yet at, to the point where the approach is restorative justice. So that's the existing system. These are the responsibilities that are undertaken in the police department, the city attorney's office, and the city administrator's office with respect to criminal justice um, today. And you can, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but um, basically the police department is the feeder for the court system. Um, they can uh, divert folks out of that system by various types of programming. And then um, the court also has the ability and the prosecutor also has the ability to divert people um, or offer evidence-based programming and, and so forth through the jail and probation program. The ad city administrator's office has traditionally in Pullman been responsible for negotiating contract nego or the county contract and administering that contract and then implementing the city hall lease. Okay, so let's take a look at Pullman's caseload. Um, I uh, highlighted some of the key uh, points here. Um, the police primarily are focused on um, misdemeanor cases, 92% of their criminal cases are misdemeanors. Very few are felonies. That's fairly atypical statewide. Um, a vast majority of the calls that come into the police department are not frequent users of police services. They're one time or a couple time users of police services, which is consistent with the uh, large student population that has served since 70% of the students uh, at WSU live in the community, not on campus. So there's a pretty big overlap between the service population for WSU police and for the city police department. The city's um, planning to add officers or has added officers um, in code enforcement and in the field um, recently. And they op the police operate the Parking Violations Bureau. So your infraction and misdemeanor caseload, um, Pullman is the second largest user of Whitman County District Court. The Washington State Patrol is by far the largest user of the Whitman County District Court. And Megan will talk about that in a bit. Um, 70 to 80% of the typical municipal court cities caseload is made up of infractions. Um, those parking tickets or traffic tickets. And in Pullman, you, your proportion of infractions is smaller, around 59%, which means that the fine and fee income is also less proportionally. Um, the misdemeanor filings over the last 20 years have declined over time, and that's in line with statewide trends. And there are three marked um, uh, higher volume misdemeanors, theft of less than $750, 
driving with license suspended and driving under the influence. Those are your top misdemeanor charges for the last three years. Uh, you have a fairly high number of indigents who require public defender services and also a fairly hefty per proportion of, of criminal offenders, misdemeanor offenders are sentenced to probation. Um, and the majority of those are low risk. The city of Pullman does not use very much jail time. Um, the Whitman County Jail has 62 beds and Pullman uses about 3.4 of them full time. Okay, Megan, take it away. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, cool. So here on the, the right side of the screen, this line graph here shows the total filings by agency to the Whitman County District Court. Um, this is between 1998 and 2018. Um, these agencies include um, Pullman Police Department, WSU PD, Whitman County Sheriff's Office, and the Washington State Patrol. Um, we controlled for population. So what you're seeing here um, is cases per 1,000. The Washington State Patrol filings per 1,000 have grown significantly over time and they've become the largest source of revenue for the court. Pullman cases per 1,000 population have declined since 2015, and this is in line with state line, statewide trends. Up here in the left-hand corner, Oops. sorry. Oh, up here, up here in the left-hand um, corner is a pie chart, and this just shows the infraction filings by each agency just for 20, the year of 2018. You can see, as Ann mentioned, um, a lot from the Washington State Patrol, while the other three agencies are pretty similar in their filings for 2018. You ready? Yep. Okay. Uh, here shows the those top misdemeanor filings for um, Pullman Police Department, and this is just in 2018. Uh, theft in the third degree, driving with license suspended in the third degree, and DUIs were Pullman's top three misdemeanor charges, but this is actually consistent for 2016 um, through 2018. Um, these in the graph here that have the asterisks next to them are charges that appear in the top 10 in 2016, 2017, and 2018 as well. Um, the top three charges um, for Pullman actually overlap with Whitman District Court, but not including the theft. And here, this is um, this slide shows the Pullman's use of the Whitman County Jail. This is from 2015 to 2018, and it's measured in days. Blue on this chart is representative of pretrial misdemeanor days, where the orange represents the post-trial misdemeanor days. On average, as Ann mentioned, um, Pullman uses 3.4 out of the 62 county jail beds per day, and that's in 2018. Roughly one third of the jail beds use is pre-sentence use. Um, usually uh, monitoring programs, they're not currently avail available, but those are what are most commonly used in lieu of pre-sentence jail. Um, overall for Pullman, the average jail stay is 6.7 days with the most common jail stay of just um, one day. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, particularly appreciate Pullman or uh, I particularly appreciate Megan's um, help with this study. She did a lot of the data crunching and slide development. And she's in a, a graduate program that will end up with her PhD in criminal justice after she's done. So it's great to have her have this experience and help the city a little bit at the same time. So here is a list of what's notable um, in Pullman's criminal justice system. Um, by notable, I mean at either unique or um, in comparison to uh, others in the state. So for court services, we estimated how many hours of court time uh, Pullman police cases only, um, which would be those that would be heard before a municipal court would occupy um, in court time, and that's 14 hours or two days. 
of um, court session on average um, per week. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, online and after hour services are very uh, limited and that's uh, unusual statewide. District court revenue collection, when we compared that to other um, district courts in the state, um, we found that the recovery uh, per infraction was a bit low, but for misdemeanors was above average court wide. Uh, for Pullman, that's also true, but um, a little bit less even than on average. And that the Washington State Patrol, um, as we've mentioned several times already, contributes the most court, court fine and fee revenue to the point where it comes very close to paying for the entire court operation. Uh, district court performance. Um, I'm not gonna repeat the information about the data. Um, they, the court does have a lower failure to respond rate compared to other district courts. That's a good thing. That means that people are doing something about their infractions, either paying for them or interacting with the court for some other um, outcome. The district court also does um, a very good job of hearings per misdemeanor, which is an indicator of efficiency. And the number of hearings per misdemeanor is lower, which is a good thing compared to other courts statewide on average. Um, this dismissal rate is somewhat higher. Dismissal of misdemeanors is what this is. Um, the deferred prosecution rate for misdemeanors um, is low compared to the rest of the state. And that's primarily because this, the court and or the city does not offer much in the way of deferral programming. Um, and that means defendants have to go all the way through the system rather than being deferred and taken in and have an intervention before it goes all the way through the system. The number of Pullman jury trials is very low um, compared to district courts in the rest of the state. Um, intervention programs. This is a place where the county and the city um, are markedly different than most other communities in the state. We have very few intervention programs. Um, one of the things that may be driving that is that the one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax for mental health and chemical dependency treatment has not been enacted in Whitman County. And so that money is not available to fund intervention programs as much as it is in other counties. Um, there are, however, a number of intervention programs or strategies that were provided with the study and some financing options that were provided with the study that the city and or the county could use to increase the number of intervention programs available, particularly to those who are in the higher volume misdemeanors. Um, the jail, um, there are a relatively low number of um, jail occupants and the city has a relatively low number of those. So the jail is an under capacity in terms of utilization. Um, the jail, jail costs are the largest criminal justice cost for Pullman followed by prosecution. And the jail cost per person, we go that far, averages $663 per misdemeanor sentence to jail. Um, I'm not gonna repeat the information about interventions which are not available in the jail or in jail alternatives like they are in other parts of the state. Okay, so now we're get to the part, the money part, which many people may be 
the most interested in, but we'll see here. So these are the cost comparisons that we did in the study. Uh, creation of a municipal court, of course, a Pullman municipal court. Um, we looked at just the service costs with or without, with and without the county prosecutor and defense services being provided um, independently or by the county. And then uh, we looked at adding some small cities that, but that proved to really not be feasible. It didn't improve the feasibility of the Pullman Municipal Court to add small cities. Um, we also looked at the existing county contract. There was a lot of interest in um, the basis in which the contract was calculated, um, some confusion about that. And so we laid out how the existing contract is um, calculated and then two alternatives to the county contract. It's different scenarios of how the, the um, costs could be um, arranged in the contract itself. Uh, this is the actual state law about um, contracting between the county and the cities. Um, you'll see the highlighted part here talks about the cost, but it also requires that when contracting, revenues need to be considered. And, and those revenues aren't only court fines and fees, but also more general criminal justice funding, um, both state provided and state authorized. Um, and there, there are other sources of criminal justice funding that were not um, taken into consideration in the existing contract that would alter the cost significantly, potentially. Okay, so what, what's the bottom line? So the Pullman Municipal Court, the net cost, which is how much it costs less revenue, um, is higher than um, the county contract in all scenarios. Um, it's marginally uh, less if the city provides its own prosecution or public defense services instead of contracting with the county. Um, the addition of startup costs and a risk factor um, makes um, the cost of the municipal court um, have some additional considerations that the city would need to look at uh, closely if you wanted to go this route. Um, startup costs were estimated at $210,000 approximately, and there's some details for those who want to know what that looks like. And then um, in the first five years of the municipal court, depending on um, how cases and revenue collection are, are handled between the district and the new municipal court, um, the city would have a risk of $330,000 to $526,000 in additional costs that the city would have to bear. Um, the county contract, there are uh, two scenarios that cost less than the existing contract and um, there are some opportunities the city would have to reduce that contract expense even farther by um, identifying either general service delivery or space trades that could be made between the partners, the county and Pullman. So this is the bottom line on uh, the municipal court and the three county contract um, scenarios. You can see that the existing county contract cost $450,000 that I've highlighted there um, is an adjustment from what the actual contract would typically um, uh, call for given how the, the service costs are calculated by the county. And there are two scenarios here that would cost the city less if those were um, substituted for the existing contracting method. 
and then the municipal court would cost uh, more than any of those, the far right lower corner. Okay, this gives you an idea of um, prosecutor and defense being independently uh, acquired by the city in the moderate um, scenario for caseload. It would come in around 109, or I'm sorry, 92,000 um, compared for, for um, prosecutor compared to 128,000 or $36,000 in potential savings. And again, these are estimates, actual costs can be impacted by a number of variables, including what judge and their philosophy, um, the actual caseload and market rates for attorneys. Okay, stakeholders who were interviewed had five concerns about service. Um, we, and I've listed them here, the current court facility located at City Hall was, was fairly unanimously agreed to be the most convenient location for city residents and all of those who have Pullman addresses who might be ticketed or charged by the County Sheriff, WSU police or the state patrol. Um, avoiding that travel to Colfax for people um, whose addresses are Pullman was valued very highly by most of the stakeholders. Um, both the municipal court and the district court would have similar service levels during regular business hours. Pullman, if it created a municipal court would have more uh, latitude to directly improve that service and technology use. Um, the city has greater technology capacity than the county. So if the city wanted to improve 24-7 um, service, the county may want to contract with the city rather in reverse, um, rather than do it themselves because of their capacity. Um, the quality of probation is pretty good, but the, uh, there are limited intervention and treatment options. Um, unlike other parts of the state, there are specific treatment um, programs that Whitman County does not currently have available. Um, and uh, again, there's a menu of funding and strategies for addressing and increasing um, intervention and treatment options in the county. Um, most of the stakeholders who were interviewed wanted to see Pullman's criminal justice system move even more toward restorative justice. Um, the current judge very much has a from what I could tell in talking to him and watching him in action in the courtroom uh, comes, has an approach that's very much aligned with restorative justice, but he's limited because of the lack of programs. Um, and then many stakeholders were, city stakeholders were interested in increasing the city's level of control and, and doing that there, the stakeholders cited some trade-offs between consistency and control. Um, cons by consistency, I mean that people who have um, committed the same offense are treated consistently with everyone else who has uh, committed that offense. So having a municipal court separate from the district court may, for example, contribute potentially to inconsistency in that arena. So level of control by the city could be improved by either forming a municipal court or um, choosing to independently contract for prosecutor or public defender or expanding the scope of the existing parking violations bureau, which the city controls. Okay, I used several slides to talk about each of the individual 
um, service to of, of the five primary service level concerns um, that the stakeholders identified. And I'm not going to go through each of these individually, um, but there are options both here and in the report for dealing with each of those concerns, either through um, working th with, with the county on the contract or doing something independently. Um, I would like to highlight the consistent quality of assault enforcement among and across law enforcement agencies, especially Pullman and WSU on and off campus. This could be addressed by the WSU police and the city police by establishing um, working group and agreements on and protocols for handling um, assault enforcement both on and off, off on and off campus to um, increase consistency. And then um, code violation consistent um, consistency of enforcement can again be addressed by um, forming municipal court, expanding the parking violations bureau um, separate from the district court or working with the district court to um, add some written criteria and written agreements into the county contract. Facilities, the last piece of this puzzle. Um, if the city wanted to do its own municipal court, you certainly have the space for it, either at Old City Hall or in the Pioneer Center, um, both which will be mostly vacated um, as you are moving to the new Civic Center space, which I understood started last week. Uh, you need about 4,200 to 4,500 square feet of space for the functions that are projected um, with the caseload projection. Uh, the current lease that the city has with the county is under market and that should be addressed no matter what. Um, you could co-locate the district court and the city municipal court if you form one in the same courtroom and office facility within that 4,200 to 4,500 square feet. And because of the um, security and use conflicts in the old city hall building right now, I am recommending that you relocate the court facilities into what used to be the senior center space. Um, the city also has a lot of space asset, assets right now, and those could be leveraged in a number of different ways to reduce, to offset part of the cost of the county contract. Um, one of the interesting things that came up in this study is that the city does have the ability to either contract for jail services legally with Whitman County or Latah County in Idaho. Um, risk on associated services, I think I'm just going to highlight that um, there is risk to, in appointing a municipal court judge um, to a change in your jail use and therefore the expense of jail services, um, depending on the philosophy of the, of the municipal court judge. The current judge is not a very heavy jail time um, user. This is, gives you an idea of what it would take time, timeline wise and critical decisions to form your own municipal court. And this um, summary takes each of the decision criteria identified by the city and, and describes which alternative maximizes the benefit to the city and its residents under each criteria, you'll find that the, a modified county contract uh, meets the majority of these um, criteria. And the court really, the municipal court creation really um, focuses on local control and therefore um, the city would need to make a decision about how important local control 
is um, versus cost. Convenience was a very, um, stakeholders were um, very focused on the convenience provided to um, residents by the court being um, in City Hall on Paradise. And there is an opportunity for, if you went with the municipal court to co-locate district and municipal court, each using two, day, two court days um, a week in the same courtroom and uh, with the 4,200 to 4,500 square feet of space there. So this brings us to the roadmap that we looked at at the beginning, which I'm not going to repeat. So the general recommendations and the secondary recommendations, and I would be glad to answer any questions. This has been a long presentation and I am, uh, I'd be glad to entertain um, email questions when uh, at a later time, well, within the next 10 days or so, if you have those and those can be directed through Mike. Um, so if there are any questions, I'd be glad to take those on at this point. Any questions, Van? And I don't have a sc screen that shows everybody right now, so. Uh, well, let me not share okay. the screen and maybe that'll help, Mayor. It probably will. Uh, yeah. No, stop sharing. Uh, Al Sorensen has his hand raised. Okay, Al Sorensen. Okay, I've I've got. I have so many questions and so many things to talk about. Uh, uh, I'm going to make a little joke here. I think you're getting paid by the hour and you did a good job. Um, uh, uh, well, I've made more notes on this thing. I have a lot to talk about in this report and this was a, an awful lot of information. And uh, I, one of the things that I want to address to start with is in regards to the quote stakeholders you're talking about, um, I think there's a, a really big, uh, I, I don't know how many stakeholders you spoke to. Uh, I think that people's views on things can skew uh, the, uh, the, the wants or the concerns of others. Uh, and I have some, uh, I have some um, concerns about uh, the idea that, that uh, uh, you know, we're, we're overly concerned about taking care of people in Pullman versus them going to Colfax. I think there was an awful lot of discussion about that at city council and, and I, for one, uh, am not totally uh, in favor of all that. I think if you are in violation of something, you will go to court wherever court is. So I think that having the stakeholders and whoever they are is, is a big deal in, in regards to how these decisions have been made by you. Um, I, I, I question that a little bit. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I have so many things on this that I, I just think that's more for a, a, another discussion at another time. This has been a, a really long report with a lot of information to be able to go through at this point. Uh, and I would like to come back and talk about this at another time uh, with city council. I'll just- We can do that. <clears throat> we can certainly schedule that. Eileen, next. Yeah, I, I took a lot more notes than I, I don't think I've ever taken as many notes. Um, uh, first off, I think uh, like Alice says, who were the stakeholders and how did you select this group of people and how many were there? So there, the number of people that were interviewed for this study are listed in the study itself in the appendix. So there were 16 interviews, some were individuals and some were groups of people. They're primarily staff from the county and the city but there were also um, elected officials, the mayor, two city council members, and the county commissioners who uh, were interviewed. So there were uh, county staff in every portion of the criminal justice system, as well as my observation in observing the court or the jail or because I did site visits. 
So will uh, I did I miss it? I didn't see the appendix in the packet. Um, the whole report was submitted to the city. I don't know what was in your I think what was it sounds like what was in your packet was just the PowerPoint that you had for your presentation tonight. But I can certainly make sure that the entire report gets sent to the council in I, working I, with the city clerk and Mike. Yeah, I think that would be I think that would be a good thing. Um, clear back on page five. Um, point number two, uh, Mayor City Council adoption of a criminal justice approach. That, that's almost a whole separate thing in and of itself, rather than just the physical plant and, and the aspects of how we're going to pay for what. So I would like to see maybe a committee or a subcommittee of council um, address that issue specifically and set aside some real time to dive into that and kind of uh, look at where we are and, and who we are and where we've been. Um, I, and that, that's almost a separate thing in and of itself. And again, like, we need to be able to drill down into this and, and have some substantive time with this, a work format of, of some sort. Um, and again, uh, maybe, I, maybe I missed it, but if WSU right, write an infraction or misdemeanor that at the present time goes to Colfax no matter what? Um, that they are a part of the district court um, caseload, but if a person has a Pullman address, then the court is held at Pullman City Hall for okay. WSU cases. Okay. That was, I, I somehow I got confused confused there and it is a little confusing yes yeah so that's yeah there's just there's just a whole heck of a lot here and we need to spend a lot more time with this before we start talking about spending a half a million dollars and uh hiring prosecutors and, and that sort of thing right and that's and we'll have a study session obviously later on mike uh you had your hand up yeah um council i found the original email that um was sent with the original 134 slides on this. What you had tonight was the pared down version so you could follow along. I'm gonna go ahead and report this to you. It's from March. So a lot of times happen between now and then. So I'm reporting that to you right now. D, you were trying to make a comment, D? I just sent it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I just sent it to all the council members. Okay, Dan Records next. V email. Okay, Dan? Um, I just wanted to thank Ann for, and Megan for all the work that they put into this. This is a lot of information. Um, it's, it's, it's really important information for us to, to spend some time, like Al and Eileen said, we need to spend some time going through this. But I really appreciate all of your efforts on this, um, especially looking at <clears throat> the, the specific different models and kind of what the impacts are on that. I think that helps frame kind of the discussion that we're going to have to have going forward with what our different options are. Um, and I, I also agree with with Eileen that I think you know the the point of coming up with a, a, a criminal justice um, policy statement or kind of a mission statement for what we want to have Pullman's vision be for for criminal justice. I think that's something that um, we need to spend some time with and and involve more than just a council working group, but but other stakeholders as well. And I'm sure Gary, you know might have some thoughts on on who would be appropriate for that as well. All right. Um, any other comments? I had one question. I was on page 35. You were talking about the current judge moves towards the restorative uh, philosophy. But then it could have been an internet issue. But then you said, but limited by. And I didn't quite hear what he was limited by. So Mayor, he's limited by the fact that the city and the county don't really have very many intervention programs or treatment programs available to offenders right now. So um, he leans in that direction philosophy wise, but he doesn't have a very big, um, a, a, a very big toolbox to use to uh, help defendants change their behavior okay were there any other questions and again we're going to be uh, pat Wright, please
Thank you, Glenn. So I essentially have the same question that you did in regard to his limitation with programs. So with those those limitations, then I'm going to make the assumption that those are provided by the county. Those limitations would still be in place at the municipal level. Is that correct? There are some things the city could do and there's some, but the majority of things the county would have to do either with the city as a partner or independently. And I mentioned a number of times this menu of strategies that was provided in the report and those that menu each item identifies which party would need to do what action. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh -huh. One more time, any other questions on this? Otherwise, we, Anne and Megan, thank you so much for a very detailed report, as you could well hear from the council reaction. And again, we've had it since March. It's now it's great to have finally the oral presentation. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. And obviously, you hear that we're going to probably have a study session going on this and probably several sessions to talk about this. So again, thank you for providing the data. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Next on the agenda is a consent agenda. These items are considered routine in nature. The council has had a chance to look at them ahead of time. Do I hear a motion to read by title only? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? With that, uh, Laura, please read Thanks. the consent agenda. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Your consent agenda consists of a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the regular meeting of October 6, 2020, and approve them as submitted. A motion to approve transfer of sales tax revenue to CIP Reserve Fund for 2020 quarter three in the amount of $169,747. A motion to approve disbursements for accounts payable checks numbered 101205 through 101258, totaling $315,000. $629.60. A motion to approve disbursements for accounts payable checks numbered 101259 through 101299, totaling $4,234,711.21. A motion to approve disbursements for utility refund numbered 101318 totaling $93.79, a motion to approve disbursements for accounts payable checks numbered 101300 through 101317, wire transfers 640, 642, 643, 645, 646, 647, and payroll direct deposits 64260 through 642. 562, totaling $1,243,017.13. A motion to approve a subrecipient agreement with Sawita for COVID 19 Public Services Project. Resolution number R 70 20, a resolution authorizing a capital assistance grant application to the Washington State Department of Transportation for replacing one diesel transit coach bus with one fully electric transit coach bus and resolution number R-71-20, resolution approving a six year transit development plan for calendar years 2020 through 2025 and 2019 annual report for the city of Pullman. Is there any item the council would like out for discussion? Seven. Number seven for Al, anyone else? Then the consent agenda consists of items one through six and Eight and nine. Do I hear a motion to approve? So moved. Do I see a second? Second from uh, Pat Wright. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? With that, we go to item number seven, Al Sorensen. Okay, just this won't take very long, uh, but I just wanted to let everybody know uh, in regards to this grant program, um, uh, there has has been a, an awful lot of activity uh, from our local businesses and uh, we couldn't have done anything better uh, to uh, move forward with uh, uh, putting money into this for our local businesses. Uh, and uh, I, I've been handing some out already that we're ahead of this uh, because I'm on the suite of board and, and helping out and people are so thankful for this. And all I'm hearing from all these local businesses is we as small businesses never get help and now we're getting the help. So uh, we did an excellent job with this. Um, we're gonna run out of money. I know there was a question about it a few weeks ago when we did this that would we be able to give it all away. 
it's going to be gone. And, uh, you know, if there's ever any more or anything else we can do, I'm sure there's going to be uh, continuing needs by our uh, local businesses for these grants. Uh, so I just, I wanted to everybody give you an update on, on what was happening here. And if we do find more money anywhere, uh, it would be tremendous for us to be able to continue to help our local businesses. It's just, it's, it's not going to get any better for a while. Okay. Um, WSU is going online again in the spring. We're not going to have the functions going on. They've changed their schedule. Um, uh, so anything, anything we can do to support our local business is what we should continue to do. Any other comments on that? And Al, do I hear a motion to approve? Yeah. Oh, yeah, excuse me, Dan Records. Well, I'm just going to say, you know, it's this has been a long time coming. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad that we were able to do this now, but um, it's it's sorely needed by our businesses. I agree with Al that this is this is absolutely what we should be doing with the bulk of the funds, the additional CARE Act dollars. Totally agree. Any other comments? <clears throat> with that, Al, do you want to make the motion? Yeah, I move to adopt. Uh, I think it was number seven. Oh, well, yeah. Nathan's on. I don't know what. Uh, no, there's Nathan. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but, I'd just like to <clears throat> real quick uh, thank Al because he helped uh, my business, um, Sweda and him. So I wanted to put it out there. Thank you, Al. Okay, well, we've had a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Second from Dan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? With that, we now move to the regular agenda. First one is an ordinance approving the final plan of Kamiak Cottages planned residential development. We've got R.J. Lott, our planning director with this one. R.J. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, City Council. Thank you for having me. The item you have before you now is the final plan of Kamiak Cottages. It's a planned residential development consisting of 12 residential lots and one proposed open space. Uh, it covers 1.8 acres. Uh, there isn't an attached copy of the plan. It's Exhibit A in your packet. Uh, the original plan, uh, the preliminary plan, was provided to the City Council for approval back on August 11th of 2020. Uh, staff examined the proposed final PRD plan and has found that it conforms to the applicable portion of the preliminary plan and that all pertinent conditions placed on the preliminary plan by the council, the construction and maintenance of outstanding improvements such as streets, utilities, and landscaping are assured through the letter of direction for Kamiak Cottages. So uh, what we're looking for on this is approval of the final plan for this uh, proposed uh, uh, PRD for Kamiak Cottages. Questions from the council or comments? Okay, uh, Eileen. Uh, need to unmute. Yeah. Yep, sorry, like I said, I got too many, too many mice. Uh, I did not hear you mention sidewalks. Are, are, are we assuming that those sidewalks are gonna go in along with all the rest of the, uh, the uh, accoutrement? Yes, correct. Thank you. Anyone else? Al. So uh, this happening in this residential neighborhood, is that has this been uh, vetted with the uh, current homeowners or possible homeowners around there? I mean, we're now putting a, a, a different level of community inside a community. Do we have any uh, response on that? Yes, there are some CCNRs for this PRD, if that's what you're asking. Okay. And for the general public, would like to know what the uh, abbreviations are. You might want to explain that too, RJ. Okay, yes. CCNRs, uh, Code, Covenances, and Restrictions. Okay. Uh, Eileen, back to you. Uh, just sort of in general, do the CCRs, are they fairly consistent with the surrounding neighborhoods? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's more more or less. I mean, there's some unique uh, features to them just because this is a planned residential development, but in general, they're, they're consistent, yes. Uh, can uh, you give me an example of a unique feature? Uh, I, I think that the common area, I think, is a, is a unique feature where uh, most subdivisions would not necessarily have that. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. Laura McAloon, our attorney. 
I, thank you, Mayor. I was just going to remind the council and point out for the public who may not understand that the CCRs are a private covenant contract between uh, the property owners that live in the neighborhood. Um, when you purchase the land and you build your house, you know that you're buying it with those CCRs in place. They get recorded. Um, generally, they run with the land. Um, so they are, they're not obligations that the city gets involved in enforcing. It's a private contractual right um, of the property owners. Uh, go back to Al again. So that's fine. I, I understand all that, but you know, did the individual property owners around this little development know this was going to be put in there? We're changing the area. Is that correct? I mean, we're changing what was intended to be there to start with. Correct. Yeah. So there was a, a public uh, opportunity for speaking with the planning commission earlier in the summer. So they did have an opportunity to speak on the item. Okay, did we have any objections? Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't have that answer in front of me I, as I was not part of the city at that time, uh, but I can certainly go back and look in the record. That's okay, I just, uh, you understand where I'm coming from here. I wanna make sure that the other surrounding private property homeowners are good, good with what's going on here because we're changing it. Is that right, Laura, we're changing the situation? The zoning, oh, I don't wanna say zoning, but. Well, there is a zone classification amendment that that changes the zoning from R2 to R2 PRD, planned residential development. Um, but it what it does is it allows the developer, the PRD provisions in the city code allow a developer um, to make different improvements um, that are it, the city recognizes that the property owners are accepting those improvements because they're agreeing to purchase that lot. Um, so it is it is slightly different. Uh, I couldn't tell you how much different the, the CC, I haven't seen the CCNRs, um, again, because those are private contractual agreements. Uh, but there was a public hearing before the Planning Commission. It was noticed and uh, signage was put up. It was um, held both virtually and then I think there was also the opportunity for in-person attendance at that time um, or no actually it got the in-person got canceled right before it happened so but there was a lot of public notice about uh, the the hearing and the recommendation from the planning commission was to send it forward to the city council for approval okay the the, the only thing I'm concerned about is not the people purchasing in this little area but the ones that are you know surrounding it and i'm just looking at the the map here and everything so if there right so the r the r2 is not know. changed so okay. it continues to be r2 zoned okay all right thank you and the uh, back to eileen so the the r2 plan residential um development that cannot be broader than the regular R2, it can be narrower. Uh, it doesn't affect occupancy. It really, what it really affects is the improvements that the developer makes. RJ, you wanna make any more comments on that? Yeah, so it, just piggybacking a little bit on that, it, it is really is a private development, you know, using private streets rather than public rights away. So. There's a little bit of a differentiation there between a, a standard subdivision and a and a planned residential development. Which means if it's private, uh, the city's not going to snowplow. That's so, correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So <laughs> that just goes back to Eileen's question about sidewalks, because he, here's the problem: uh, we've had a number of private, uh, non-public areas put in. They've not been required to put sidewalks in. And I'm thinking of one specific one where they've turned it back over to the city and now there's no sidewalks. So in this development, is there a way for us to require there to be sidewalks put in? There are sidewalks uh, adjacent to the parking areas. So yes, that they are in place there. 
So I'm talking about walking along the street and up around. Yes, yeah, so the, there are there are sidewalks there. I, I don't know if I'm understanding your co your question correctly there. I'm sorry. I, I, I see Clayton, Clayton, Clayton probably knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, let's go to Clayton from Forsman here. Sure, I, I, I can help out here a little bit, RJ, and hopefully clarify, I think, what Al's getting at. Um, so RJ's talking about the PRD, which is the, in the exhibit, it's the 1.8 acres at the end of Kamiak Court. So those sidewalks are all private and those sidewalks will be built as part of the PRD um, before any of those buildings are occupied. Now the lower portion is part of a preliminary plat for Paradise Hills 8, and that's a traditional subdivision that I'm gonna be presenting a little bit later tonight. And on that portion, that's vested under um, the design standards from 2017, so that portion of sidewalk, they have three years to build along Kamiak Court. Now, what we have done is during the hearing um, with the PRD is we've stated that one side of the sidewalk, so the north side of the sidewalk along Kamiak Court shall be completed in this portion of the subdivision that's public before any occupancy in the PRD. So it's vested to have three years, but we've, we have a condition from the preliminary plat and preliminary PRD process where we required the north sidewalk to be built prior to occupancy for any buildings in the PRD. Well, I hope that made sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments? With that, do I hear a motion on this ordinance? Move to adopt ordinance 20-8. Do I hear a second? Second. So I, okay, I, I don't, uh, you got the second, either came from Nathan or, or Pat had her hand up as well. So uh, D's got it. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye and raise your hand. Hi. Hi. Uh, Hi. Okay, I saw three three eyes. Okay, out of five. So the motion carries. But I want to make sure that I'm looking at Laura though for that determination. I would go ahead and call the nays. Um, okay. And then it is an ordinance, so we do need to read the title for the record. Okay. I just okay. Let's let's do the uh, those opposed. Okay, I see two. Okay, read it two. And again, uh, Laura, do you want to read the ordinance? Yes, it's ordinance number twenty eight, an ordinance approving the final plan of Kamiak Cottages planned residential development located southeast of Northwest Terra View Drive, Drive, and Northwest Canyon View Drive on Military Hill. Okay, the matter passes three to two. We now go to the next item. Is item number two. It's a resolution authorizing the execution of a wireless communication facility permit agreement, Clayton Forsman. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Inland Cellular LLC has been actively working with city staff to locate a wireless communication facility at our water tank number 10 site, which is located at 1885 Southwest Barclay Ridge Drive. And this is to enhance their service by increasing their coverage footprint, thereby providing service to additional areas that they currently are unable to. Their proposed facility includes a fenced and screened equipment pad located west of the tank, along with six panel antennas that will be mounted on the tank. All improvements have been reviewed and approved by city staff via the site plan committee this included a review of their proposed equipment to verify compliance with the applicable noise standards per the zoning code. In order to move forward with this installation, a wireless communications facility permit agreement must be approved and executed. The agreement has been prepared by city staff and signed by Inland Cellular. 
It is included in your council packet and is consistent with our other wireless communication facility permit agreements. The initial annual rent is set at $10,500 per year, which will be adjusted by the CPI every five years. Staff recommends adoption of the resolution to authorize the wireless communication facility permit agreement with Inland Cellular. I'd be glad to take any questions. Any questions uh, of Clayton on this? Now we go back to Al Sorensen. Um, okay, I do have a lot of questions. Um, and there's a, a really good reason for this. So uh, when this tower was first put in back in 2009, it was my understanding that there weren't going to ever be any uh, radio antennas put on the tower. Do you know anything about that? That was before my time, but I can tell you that the tank was built with um, tabs mounted to the side in anticipation of future providers, providers contacting us. And I think it's just been this long before we've had any interest. So I guess I'm saying, I think that they anticipated this would come up when they built the tank. Um, this, this tank particularly uh, is uh, a lot closer to residential construction than most other tanks in town. And there's a problem in my opinion, with the aesthetic view of this and the problem that it could cause uh, for the residents living around the tank. And then uh, besides that, I know that this one's gonna be put on the west side, uh, but what's gonna prevent anything from being put around the whole dang thing uh, like other tanks in this town to where it becomes to look like um, uh, kind of a circus act. So what we've what's uh, been looked at here to try to mitigate those concerns, Al, because we're um, we're aware of you know the residential aspect of this. Um, that the ground area is fenced and it's chain link fenced with vinyl slats. It's located strategically west of the tank. Um, we've looked at the noise, as I mentioned to make sure that we're not creating an issue where we're um, violating any noise standards. So those are the things that we've looked at um, to, to keep that um, in mind, the comments that you mentioned. So with this coming down, were any of the residents uh, contacted uh, within a certain area of this tank and these things going on? No. So why do we not do that as we would normally if something else was happening in the neighborhood. Laura, maybe you can address that, I don't know. I'm not sure why, um, but I'm not aware of us doing that in the past now with these. The, so any of these um, permits have to be issued and approved by the city council. So that's the process for controlling what it looks like um, other than the fact though that it it does have to be um, standard non-discriminatory rational and reasonable and related to what impact it is that you're trying to um, control so I guess I'm not I'm not sure what type of well, limitations I, you're you want to put on it the, I, I don't want any limitations what I want is uh, for for the residents that live in a very short distance of this particular water tower to be notified of what they're going to have in their backyard or out their front yard or, or whatever and the aesthetics and the noise and the radio waves and everything else is this going to include 5g and we're talking about health issues with 5g um you know i mean i i'm i'm extremely concerned about this particular situation I think one of the approaches just um, that Kevin's kind of mentioned um, in the past is, you know, because I've often wondered why we're doing a lot of these, because um, they do take a quite a bit of staff time to 
Uh, as you know, we have these located on all of the rest of our tanks in town. And I think a lot of it is just to provide the service to people in the community. You know, it will, um, as I mentioned, um, Inland looked at this tank and they could really expand their coverage and provide service to people that they can't do, can't provide service to right now. So I think that's um, one of the reasons we've always um, tried to work with the providers. And ultimately, you know, it's whatever the council would like to do here. Um, you know, that's why we bring these to you guys, so. Well, my, my concern is of the residents that are within close proximity of this. That's a concern mine. So that's where I'm coming from. Nathan, I saw your hand up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Johnson. I will uh, just say that, um, you know, <sighs> saying 5G is, is causing harm, um, which is what uh, seems to be implied, um, is not... Um, necessarily true. I will just uh, say that. And we have not approved, we have not approved the 5G ordinance for the city. It was, that was on the table. It's still being worked on. Moscow's talking about it right now, but we have not got to 5G. We've had a lot of pressure to get a 5G ordinance done, uh, including from some of our state representatives. But we have not got that before the council yet to even approve 5G for the city. So we're, that's still being worked on as far as I know. And uh, Al, I, can, I do recall because I had to break the vote. It was happening up on uh, Sunnyside Hill where we had a tower that was a cellular tower that was extremely close to residents. And I broke the tie, the tie at that time and was voted against it because I was, the, the, the proximity to a home and the RF frequency that came off that cell tower to me was too much. And so that, I know we have had residents notified before, but that was on a tower issue and that was on Sunnyside Hill. And that was a good number of years ago. Well, I throw this out to all council members. If this was built in your front yard or your backyard, would you want it there? And I agree with you, Glenn. Is it the proximity of whatever? And Nathan, I wasn't saying 5G causes a problem. I just brought it up because it's in the talk. Um, and it's uh, a situation where I wanna make sure that, uh, I, I don't know of any other tank in town that I can think of that has any residential houses closer to a water tower than this one on Barclay Ridge. Okay, uh, Dan? Um, I think, you know, we should address the issues with this particular contract tonight, but I think we might, you know, based on some of the concerns that Al's raising, we might want to consider whether or not we want to adopt a strategy for determining when some criteria for, for these in the future that we may want to do a, additional outreach to surrounding residential um is that something that that is possible to to have as a policy for for going forward with these contracts laura yes that's a, that's a good suggestion council member records um right now the city doesn't have any policy in place for identifying neighbors of um well for specifically identifying giving neighbors specific notice that this is being considered putting something on your agenda is notice to the public though um mm -hmm. so there is some notice that goes out you could certainly you know you could certainly choose to defer this if you wanted to do some public outreach and and ask for public input on this specific uh lease agreement um but but it, it, going forward you you should if that's what you want to do, you should adopt a standardized policy that says this is what we'll do whenever we get this type of an agreement. Let's go back to Dan, because I think I saw your hand uh, there and then we'll go back. Yeah, I, I think based on kind of the mitigating factors that, that claim laid out for this particular agreement, I think some of those are 
are addressing some of those concerns, but I, I do think that, you know, if we're looking at, you know, the proliferation of, of antennas on other towers that we've seen, we may want to consider that, especially for this particular tower that's so close to residential facilities as well um, for, for future consideration. Uh, Clayton? Uh, just for uh, full transparency, um, I do want to mention that we have been contacted and have been um, working through the same process with Verizon for this exact same tower. So um, there's room for them to be located west as well, but I just want everyone to know that that's something else. So that could change how you consider this, and that's why I wanted to mention it. It's just not to the point where I could bring it. And based on how this goes, we'll probably shape how we deal with that one. So. Okay, Al? Uh, just more reason for us to do what Dan just suggested. My suggestion is for us to not agree to this tonight and to come up with something, at least to notify the residents of this before anything can happen. It's This tower's there for 11 years now um, and with nothing on it. Uh, and the idea that residents are notified by it being put on public notice because it's going to be talked at at a city council meeting is not good enough notice, in my opinion. Um, it may be, quote, public notice, but um, I'm going to tell you right now, the neighboring people that live up here do not know about this. They do not know about this. And, 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 and I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you with full disclosure, you know what my address is? It's 1885 Barclay Ridge. Where is that? Directly across the street from the water tower. And I can tell you that none of my neighbors know about this. So uh, you know where my vote is going to be on this? And yes, it's because of where I live, but it's also a concern about other things in this town. It's not just primarily about this water tower, but it's any of the other ones that we need to let people know what's happening. Uh, Eileen. Yeah, is there like a, a semantic confusion in my mind between like a water tank and a water tower? Because there's like a water tank that's above, up above Janet Street, I think it's Upper Drive, that you, I mean, you can't even tell that it's a water tower but it is a water tank and it is very well um, blended into the neighborhood with the siding and everything. And I don't think it has antennas all over it. So it's not like we can't do a real good job of this because we can. And, and I agree with, uh, with these uh, quality of life in our neighborhoods is very, very important. And with lifestyle changes that we may be faced with permanently due to COVID, we have to be very diligent about what we're you know placing on our neighborhoods without talking with our neighbors because our challenges are, are different than they were a year ago a year ago i would have voted with, for this you know without question but just due to our lifestyle changes and we want to preserve our property values and the quality of life in our neighborhoods we're kind of in a different spot than we were a year ago and who knows where we're going to be a year from now but uh, but let's uh, let's let's be a little cautious here let's be a little kinder here any other comments um you've heard it one suggestion to defer until we have a chance to notify the people you also have a chance to make a motion to approve or not um and laura is there any other course of action that you would like to make sure the council's aware of no i think it it's simply someone needs to make a motion as to how they want to proceed and then deal with it from there. Okay. So, well, I would make a motion to postpone this okay. until we can um, determine how to notify the, the neighboring residences. Okay. okay. Do I hear a second, second to the postpone? Okay. okay. That was uh, rather quick. All those in favor of postponing, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed to that? Okay, it is postponed. And Clayton, you can let the word know to Inland Cellular. Okay. You Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Okay, we now move to item number three. It's a resolution approving the final plat of Paradise Hill subdivision. 
Number 10, authorizing the mayor and the finance administrative services director to sign the final plan. Once again, plate enforcement. Thank you, Mayor. The item uh, we presented to you now is a resolution accepting the final plat of Paradise Hills subdivision number 10. The preliminary plat of Paradise Hills subdivision number eight was for the division of approximately 43 acres into 76 lots within the Paradise Hills development on the westerly end of Terraview Drive. The council approved the preliminary plat on March 14, 2017. The developer has chosen to final plat the property in phases. Council previously approved the first two phases with the final plat of Paradise Hills number eight and number nine. The third phase, which is before you now, consists of 5.77 acres and 16 building lots. It includes the south section of Canyon View Drive, which will complete the Canyon View Drive connection from Greyhound Way to Terraview Drive. Also of note is a third edition of traffic calming on this section of Canyon View Drive, which consists of lane narrowing from 33 feet down to 20 feet. Sidewalks for this subdivision fall under the previous design standards that allow for three years to complete. A letter of direction has been prepared to guarantee the construction of improvements and to appropriately warrant the maintenance of improvements and it's included in your staff report, or your council packet, excuse me. It is staff's recommendation that the final plat of Paradise Hills subdivision number 10 be accepted by council, and that you authorize the mayor and finance and administrative services director to sign the final plat. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions on this one? Okay, go to Al. Clayton, I'm I'm super super concerned about the traffic level uh, on this now because uh, we're going to allow this now to go through, which we've talked about for a long time. But it's now going to be the shortcut to uh, an awful lot of people to Kamiak uh, and uh, Elementary School or Kamiak Elementary School, whatever. What what is the name of that elementary school up there? Kamiak. Okay, thank you, Glenn. <laughs> um, and it, it's now going to become uh, the preferred way of travel, uh, just like we've had occur on a number of other streets in town. Uh, and I'll just throw out the Marsh to Drive situation. Um, and uh, the traffic calming idea of a narrowing of the street might be a good idea, but um, I'm I'm concerned about the flow of traffic on this street um, and uh, what other things we're going to be doing besides narrowing of the street. And I'm not a huge fan of the narrowing of the street situation. So what else can we do? Well, we, we can certainly monitor it, um, Al. The, the traffic calming uh, came out of the preliminary plat back in 2017. And that was something that um, a lot of people came. Uh, I wasn't at the, the meeting, but I read the notes um, and I read the conditions. And I think there was some people that had the same concern that you're talking about. And so the planning commission added, the co added a condition for this traffic calming. And so that is our approach. Um, certainly the connection is a good connection um people now you know currently have to travel a long ways around depending on where they live um the other thing um besides monitoring it um is i've been talking with steve mater and he is hoping and now you know there's no guarantee but he's hoping to um, ramp up his uh his timing of development in this area and he's looking at trying to make the terror view connection sooner rather than later. And so when that happens, that will, you know, provide a second connection. And so you can kind of split the traffic at that point. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Other, uh, other questions or comments? 
Al, you're muted. I sorry. Thanks, Dan. I quit. I was on and then I was off. Uh, um, I just I, I there's just the concerns about the travel of all this, um, you know, in and out, one way in, two ways out, one way in, whatever. And and I just I I really look forward to some future planning that helps us. Uh, try to do measures ahead of time. Uh, you know, we're fitting pieces together. We're kind of creating new puzzle pieces as we go along. And I'm, I'm hoping that we're able to kind of uh, control that a little bit because we need to make, you know, these um, streets like this, not slower and narrower, but bigger and wider, in my opinion, <laughs> you know, so that we can move people around, right? Um, and so um, I'm just, I'm, I'm overly concerned about this. And I do know that uh, Steve Mater and his development company do an excellent job of taking care of things. I have no problem with that. I'm just concerned about the narrower part of Canyon Drive that already has established homes and children living in it um, for all of this. And, and I'm telling you right now, this will become the thoroughfare uh, for getting to that elementary school. So, yeah. Eileen, next. Un need to unmute. Sorry, I'm using two different mice on two different screens. Um, and again, to, to follow up, I think what, what at least some of our council members' directions has been sparkling clear. In the letter of direction, the second to the last paragraph, and I realize this is probably boilerplate language, but it says, Adequate infrastructure, including not necessarily limited to water, sewer, storm drainage, electricity, natural gas, and streets has been provided. Again, can we please, in the future, put sidewalks into these boilerplate documents? I, I think that we're all concerned about this issue. We've been talking about it like crazy for the last three or four years. Let's, uh, let's make it easy on everybody so we don't have to have this, this type of discussion. Make sure that you put sidewalks in there, especially in a place that is so close to an elementary school. People are going to be using those sidewalks. They need to be they need to be there on day one, even before the first building is occupied, as it indicates in the document. But let's spell it out. It's just a few, or just inconvenience of a few electrons to put it on paper. Okay. Um, see any other council? Okay, back to Al. I, thanks, Eileen. I, I appreciate those comments because, um, and, and I'm going to have to, when this meeting is over, I will be researching our uh, 2017 sidewalk discussion because I, I thought that we were going to have these sidewalks put in earlier than later. And so I'm a little bit confused on all of this because I thought that, that we changed that. And I think the three-year thing was one of those deals that we had. And I'm totally with you. These are things that need to be put in ahead of time. And, and I'm, I, I will, I'll talk to you more, Clayton, about it at another time. But uh, th this is a situation where we, we can't afford not to have the sidewalks in. Okay. Laura, were you getting ready to say something? Um, we can certainly talk offline with um, Council Member Sorensen about vested yeah. rights and the timing of. And of that uh, decision. And just to balance one of the comments, the narrowing does work. I mean, I, the engineers have done the study and I definitely have seen the improvement on a couple of our streets where we have narrowed it. The traffic has slowed down and it's a lot safer for the kids to walk on the sidewalks because of some of those narrowed that, that uh, our public works department has done. So I'm just gonna balance those comments a little bit. Yeah, uh, if the side other, Pardon? If the sidewalks are there, yeah, they were there. So, okay. Do I, uh, with no other comments, do I hear a motion on this resolution? Move to adopt. Okay, from Nathan. Second. second. And Laura, would you read the resolution language? Resolution number R-73-20, a resolution approving the final plat of Paradise Hills subdivision number 10 and authorizing the mayor and the finance and administrative services director to sign the final plat. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. One nay. Okay. With that, we now move to item number four. It's a resolution approving the final plat of Paradise Hill subdivision number 11, authorizing the mayor and the finance administrative services director to sign the final plat. Once again, Dwight and Forsman. Thank you, Mayor. So the next item is Paradise Hills subdivision number 11. Um, I've already spoke about the preliminary plat of Paradise Hills number eight back in 2017. Um, we just uh, went through Paradise Hills 10, the third phase. So the fourth phase is Paradise Hills number 11. And this consists of 3.72 acres with 18 building lots. It includes Kamiak Court, along with the Kamiak Cottages PRD, which was presented earlier tonight by Planning Director R.J. Lott. Um, a letter of direction has been prepared to guarantee the construction of improvements and to appropriately warrant the maintenance of improvements. It's staff's recommendation that the final plot of Paradise Hills Subdivision Number 11 be accepted by Council and that we authorize the mayor and finance and administrative services director to sign the final plot. Go ahead to answer any questions. Questions of um, Clayton on number 11. Eileen. Sorry. Why does this one specifically say on the second page, second paragraph? on acceptance by the director of all required public works improvements with the exception of sidewalks as shown on the improvements drawing, improvement drawings, excuse me. So are you looking at the letter of direction, Eileen? I am. Second so, paragraph, page two, with the exception so, sidewalks. Am so if you, if you read further along, the sidewalks is not required within the first year. So. Once it's final platted, all public works improvements need to be constructed within one year of the final plat. Anything that's not constructed today, we get a security to guarantee the improvements are built. Um, and then the sidewalks have three years. So the following sentence or somewhere just down below that, I don't have it in front of me. Um, we'll talk about the sidewalks, which they have three years because they're vested under the old design standards. So that is the, the reason it's broke out that way. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, do I hear a motion on this resolution? Move to adopt resolution number R74-20. Second. Second. From, from Nathan. Uh, Laura, do you want to read this resolution? Resolution number R-74-20, a resolution approving the final plat of Paradise Hills subdivision number 11 and authorizing the mayor and the finance and administrative services director to sign the final plat. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Two nays. Matter carries. With that, uh, I'm gonna ask our uh, Great IT staff, if we have anybody on the public call in line for any new business. Thank you very much, Rob. With that, uh, any new business from the council? Seeing none, do I hear a motion? No. To okay. Councilwoman, right. Okay, right. <laughs> Pat. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is appropriate in new business. It got away from me when we were in the area of the consent agenda, but I have believe it or not, already gotten a couple of questions in regard to item number seven, which was the um, motion to approve the sub the subrecipient agreement with SWEDA for the COVID-19 services project, which my understanding was those are the CARES dollars that were made available for grant applications, and that there was some um, confusion as to uh, Nathan's receiving help from council member Sorensen in regard to those grants. And it was um, interpreted as council member Sorensen giving 
some assistance to Council Member Weller. So if we could just maybe have some clarification as to that. Thank you, Pat, that was, um, so Al, you said on part of SWEDA, because you serve on the SWEDA board, correct? Right. Um, I have uh, been helping hand out the checks in the city of Pullman because I am the representative of the city of Pullman on the SWEDA board to help them with the uh, number of checks that are being handed out. I had nothing to do with uh, whether Nathan got a grant or not. I'm just helping distribute them to the businesses in Pullman. That's all, right? Yeah, and, I understand that. I just, we just needed further clarification for our viewers tonight. Uh, may I ask who the viewers may be? Uh, let's, why don't we just go on to Nathan and then we'll go to Dan Records. Nathan? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council Member Sorensen and Council Member uh, Wright. Yeah. Um, I have two businesses, uh, Gorilla Paintball and um, Weller Consulting Firm. Uh, so thank you so much for me being able to, uh, you know, now express that. Um, so yes, uh, I did receive that funding. Uh, it was before uh, Pullman gave any uh, funding um to to myself so in any case yeah okay dan that's all i was going to say is just to clarify that this you know that that award was made from the county cares act dollars and not from pullman cares act dollars so there's i, I don't think there's um I, I understand the concern from from residents uh, at hearing something like that but um those were separate funds not the funds we were talking about tonight Okay, Al, I saw your hand go up again. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. The, 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 the funds that have been given out so far, no, no money from the Pullman Cares Act has been distributed yet. Okay, zero. That's that what we needed that clarification was, for. That was not approved for us to do with SWEDA until tonight. Correct. So uh, anything done prior to today or tomorrow now at this point has absolutely nothing to do with the Pullman Cares Act money. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. With that item, now do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. See you next week.